Controllers are one of the most important decisions when it comes to making a console. Like, how am I going to play Wii Sports? With thumbsticks? Ew. And after recently buying and playing the Switch and a PS5, something dawned on me. Not only did I lose all my college fund, but these controllers were built with the console in mind, and the consoles would never have been a success if it wasn't for these controllers. Which explains why the PS3 failed. Now, I'm not a waz, I'm not going to talk about the whole history of the controllers, just some controllers that had an impact on the gaming world or ones I developed a bond with. Let's start off with the most recognizable controller in history. The DK Bongos, of course, with that or the original Atari controller. Though not as good as a DK controller, the Atari joystick is an icon of retro gaming, since that was truly the first one to be extremely successful. It had a joystick, cause I mean, have you been to an arcade? Oh wait. Now though the arcades had systems with some really diverse and interesting controller schemes, the majority of it could be boiled down to stick and button. Why have a steering wheel and guest pedal when you can press the button and a joystick to steer? And though I have never played a game with an Atari controller, the common knowledge is that, well, it aged. But a controller I think didn't age too badly was the NES controller. The NES controller is like Marisa Tomei, they don't look their age. Coming out of the 80s, the NES controller is a foundation of all controllers to come afterwards. Doesn't matter the button names or the triggers or whatever else it may have, it all started here. But I'm not a history teacher, this skip forward to a game controller that I think came outside the box compared to his competition, oh god no, put it back in the box. I played the 64 and PlayStation, and while I did find the PlayStation SNES love letter to be a lot more usable and, well, functional, the 64 controller gets points for just being out there. I mean, games like Mario 64 played great with the controller, but that's because the controller was made for that game. Have you tried playing Perfect Dark on the 64? The weird button layout really held it back. I mean, some games are fine with the scheme, and some games are built around the fact that you had to hold it in different ways. But it was never ideal. No kids saw this controller and thought, when I grew up. On the other side of the fence, PlayStation had this controller, which I love. Now, it is a SNES fan mod, but it's great nonetheless. When I bought my PS2, the seller gave me a broken PS2 controller and a PS1 controller with joysticks. And I've had my roadie with the original one at my cousin's house while we binge Tony Hawk, and it's a controller I have almost no issues with. Almost. For a controller with only a D-pad, it does get very worn out really fast, and a D-pad can get real stiff sometimes. After the DualShock 1 controller, the DualShock 2 controller came out and yeah, it's the same thing. Now maybe it's cause I'm so used to the new controllers nowadays, but the DualShock 2 and even 3 feels too small. Xbox threw their hats in the rings and came out with this beefy controller. This is a weird one because there's nothing that wrong about it, it's just an eyesore. Have you ever left your house and felt like you're missing something and you start getting anxious about it? This will look at the OG Xbox controller feels like. They did release a more family safe controller down the line, but I think this generation was an iconic generation with controllers, with all of them feeling different from one another. The next generation, however, had some of the most perfect controllers and copied homework. The DualShock 3 was actually not the first PS3 controller. First, there was this monster, the boomerang as people call it. It was shot off at E3, hated, the never seen again. People say that the reason for this odd design was to show off the motion capabilities of the PS3 controllers, but no one was sure. The 6 axis was the first controller to be released. No vibrations though, and the motion controls it sacrificed the Rumble 4 was beyond bad. That was replaced by the DualShock 3, which was the solution to all the problems. It was usable, it had rumble, perfect. Xbox created this controller for its Xbox 360 and this, this is peak perfection. This controller is considered one of the best, if not the best out there. It's a design that Xbox would always be using afterwards, for better or worse, but compared to the DualShock 3, it was way more comfortable. It did run on batteries though, which was the only insult I could bring up in playground fights. This was, at the time, the best designed controller out there. Then Xbox spat in his face and said, who needs controllers, just move your arms. <coughs> Nintendo won the generation with the Wii, whose controller was just a TV remote. But this very simple design is what helped it win the generation. Those don't need to know what R2 was and wait, there's an R3? The swing, bowl, smack, turn it sideways, now it's a real controller. This controller was nothing special, and that's what's so special about it. But on this motion control tangent, can we talk about some of the most overlooked controllers of this era? The PS Move? Say what you will about it, the Move controllers was a lot better when it came to motion tracking compared to the first generation of Wii remotes. It's not as simple as a Wii remote, which is why I think I never surpassed them, but to be fair, the Kinect had the most simplest controllers and it was still bad. Whoopan! There it is. Last generation was home to some of the most revolutionary controllers that changed the game, and Xbox using the 360 controller again. Like I said, it's copy and paste. Sure, it's kind of different, kind of, but it's pretty much the same exact thing. They did the same exact thing with this generation, so I'm just gonna skip them for now. The DualShock 4 was a huge leap for PlayStation, as in they finally changed the controllers. Not into something as stupid as Boomerang, it's also old DNA of prior controllers, but the inclusion of this touchpad and LED lights are the definition of useless. Well, I say that, but I really like its inclusion. I love seeing the colors change based on the game or whatever is happening in the game. 
but that's if I noticed. Sometimes I'm so invested in the game, I forget there's an LED light in there. The DualSense was an actual leap in every imaginable way. The haptic feedbacks, the adaptive triggers, the fact that the controller has a mic that you can use and hear a party chat. The controller has things that I'd want to help me immerse myself in the game and it helped me play with friends with my headset broke. Xbox? Yeah, and Nintendo has a Switch with their Joy Cons, and yes, they are prone to have drifts. It's never a matter of if, it's when. When would I get drift? But this is such a cool idea for a set of controllers, being able to play on a console with Joy Cons, or sitting on a dog and playing with a grip, or getting one to your friend and playing together. It's such a Nintendo thing to do. While PlayStation was always about innovation, Xbox about comfort, and Nintendo about being outside the box, they are always able to add their own tweaks and things to make their controllers feel like their own. The 64 stands out against the Xbox controller as well as the PlayStation and the Wii. Even the Move and the Wii controllers are so different. Sony's focus on immersion makes me excited for the PSVR 2. The success of the Switch's uniqueness makes me wonder what they'll do next. And while Xbox isn't that different from their past, it makes me wonder what they'll do to just fire the controllers in the future. All in all, controllers are fascinating, and I'm glad you found it fascinating enough to watch this video. Here's some videos on the screen you can check out if you have the time, and thanks for watching. I'll see you next time, just keep an eye out.